So um, tonight, it's going to be, um, I'm, I'm kind of doing a playoff of the sermon that was done Sunday about demons. And Pastor Todd mentioned this, I mean, a couple times, and you did it on the, if you're not watching Monday nights on Facebook, what are you doing? <laughs> what, what? You got to comment, like, share, subscribe, the whole nine. That's what you got to do, right? But tonight, I want you guys to hear scripture, um, and, and I want you to meditate on what we're going to be talking about tonight, because tonight, um, I'm going to talk about this. Not everything that is wrong is a demon, Okay? And we'll talk about that, right? 1 Peter 2, 9 through 10. If you've got your Bibles, great. If you don't, go ahead and pull it up on your phone. 1 Peter 2, 9 through 10. And everybody, this scripture is familiar, but I want to walk you through it, okay? It says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession so that you might proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Verse 10, for you were once not a people, but you are now the people of God and you had not received mercy, but now you've received mercy. Verse 11, beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshy lusts, which wage war against your soul. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles so that the thing which they slander you as evildoers they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. Right? There was a lot of you keep, you do. And one, one of the things I noticed about verse 9, if you guys didn't catch it, so that you might proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And I fear we sometimes proclaim the problem or the spirit of it or something instead of proclaiming the excellencies of God who brought us out of that darkness into his light. Amen? So not everything is a demon or something like that. And I'm speaking tonight like on this, this, this uh, topic. And I say this because the more and more I have this conversation with people as I disciple more and all these other things, these are some of the things that come up, right? I have a problem with lust. And I can't shake it, so it's obviously a spirit of lust, right? Or I have a problem with spending, and I can't shake it, so it must be the spirit of greed, Okay, I have a problem with my weight, so it obviously is a spirit of gluttony. And I'm going to blow that one out of the water in a minute, okay? I have a problem with getting up in the morning to read my Bible and pray to the Lord, so it's obviously a spirit of laziness. I even heard one time in a service, I wrote this in my notes, I was probably 13, and there was a pastor praying over the service, and he said, I see a lot of people tired in here, and I'm praying against the spirit of coffee this morning. I didn't find that in the scriptures. But apparently, he saw something. Is everything a demon? And I used to joke with my mom about this. Is there like a demon behind every doorknob or something? Are we chasing something that isn't there? Listen, why are we giving the devil more authority and power that he doesn't have? Okay, that's the question. Now, I'm not ignorant, y'all. I get it. There's demonic influence out there. 1 Peter 5 says, be sober of spirit. Be on the alert because your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Yes, there is demonic influence, right? But there's a massive difference between a stronghold of the mind and a demonic possession or oppression. Amen? So we're going to get into this. Did you guys know that lions can't run very fast and they can't run very far because of the size of their lungs and heart? So they wait till the animal or the prey is about 15 feet away to attack. Think about this, right? So you have to be off your guard and you're not paying attention to the lion coming, right? So the prey, if the prey is far away and vigilant, listen close, it can spot the lion, but if it's distracted, it isn't paying attention and it will be attacked and it will die. The purpose of Satan is to destroy you. And we're supposed to draw near to God and resist the enemy. Read James 4. I'm just going to read this over you. I want you to pay attention to this. What is the source, he says, James 4, verse 1 through 8. What is the source of your conflicts and quarrels among you? 
Is it not the source of your pleasures that wage war in your members? Notice he didn't say anything about, you know that spirit of whatever? It's waging war. He says, no, it's your lusts and your things that are in your body that are warring against you. Listen to this. You lust, you lust, and you don't have. So you commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask, and when you do ask, uh, you ask with the wrong motives. Notice that none of that had to do with the spirit of the enemy or the devil or a demon. It was everything to do with who? Me. I'll get to my point here in a second. And he says this, you adulteresses and adulterers, don't you know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? What, I, what I'm saying through this is you become a friend of the world, not the devil making you a friend of the world. You become a friend of the world, and we blame God, and uh, trust me, this is going to get really good. And it says this, therefore, who wishes uh, to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that scripture speaks of no purpose? Um, he jealously desires the spirit which he has made to dwell in us. And then he says this, but he gives the greater grace. Therefore, God, it, it is said, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Now listen to the next one. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the enemy, and guess what happens to him? He runs. When you're not submitted to God, when you're not humbling yourself, you leave yourself open to the attack from the enemy, and he's coming to destroy you. So was it the enemy's fault, or was it me not being vigilant with the Lord to make sure that I'm guarded in my heart? Amen? King David said, I've hidden my word in my heart, your word in my heart, so I would not sin against you. And I think one of the biggest problems is when we start to blame the enemy for what we do wrong, you do one thing that is terrible in the eyes of God. You don't take responsibility for your own action. And you know what happens with that? You know what happens with that? How can you repent for something that you didn't do? Why do we repent of sins when we didn't commit them? Because that's your thought process. The demon made me do it. It's the devil. Folks, I'm going to be honest with you. My wife, you all know the story. Y'all prayed for us. It wasn't, I don't care what you, listen, we live in a fallen world. Our bodies break down. My back hurt, used to hurt sometimes before I started losing weight. Was that the enemy or was it I was carrying in excess of 150 pounds? Let's be honest. Was it the enemy or was it me? My knees, like this is what I want to say, even tonight. Some of us have been healed in the room. And then you, when it comes back to you, you blame the enemy. But did you change your eating habits? Did you take care of your temple? Here's another one. How about this? He restored my relationship, Lord. You, you, you healed my relationship. But then we broke up again. Why? Did you change your attitude? Are you walking in the fruits of the Spirit? And we're blaming the enemy for things we didn't do? Or the responsibilities that we needed to have? And these are hard questions to ask, but they're necessary. Necessary to ask, right? Holiness, listen to this. Holiness is not freedom from temptation, but the power to overcome it. Holiness is not freedom from temptation, but it's the power to overcome it. And if Jesus needed prayer for the Holy Spirit to empower him during temptation, what does it say about our abilities to be successful in the spiritual fight if we fail to do that? How can we be successful if Jesus needed to pray and needed to quote the word, right? He didn't blame, when he was tempted by the devil, he wasn't saying, why are you tempting me? He's like, no, 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 I'm gonna speak of the excellencies of God. His word says this, you ain't touching me, amen? It wasn't the devil, it wasn't the enemy, it wasn't any of that stuff. And I think, I think that people confuse demonic oppression with a stronghold, let me explain. A stronghold is a deceptive thought pattern that leads to a certain behavior. I'll say that again. A stronghold is a deceptive thought pattern that leads to a behavior, okay? And I'll explain more in a minute. If you guys go to 2 Corinthians uh, uh, chapter 10, it says, for though we walk in the flesh, we don't war according to the flesh. 2 Corinthians 10. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses or strongholds. You guys see that? The weapons are to destroy 
strongholds. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised against the knowledge of God, and we are taking every single thought captive to the obedience of Christ, and we're ready to punish all forms of disobedience when your obedience becomes fulfilled. Watch this. L listen to this again. We're taking every thought captive, right, to the obedience of Christ, and then he says this, we turn around and do the action. I'm ready to punish all forms of disobedience when our obedience is fulfilled. That's what's so cool is, I think sometimes we don't take the thoughts captive, and then we're under it, right? And then we come here to church, we come here to church to get delivered from something you're doing. That's not a, listen, this is meant to set you free. You're about to get set free in a minute. When I'm preaching this, it's not, I'm preaching this as much to myself as I am to everybody else, okay? So this isn't about, this isn't about who I'm pointing the finger at. We all got something. And you know what? I'm sick and tired of giving the enemy the power over myself because he doesn't have it. Amen? The reason I'm preaching is because I was caught up in this fight and lust was winning. And I'm talking about all kinds of lust, my desires, my focus, everything. But you know what the real problem was? I wasn't reading the Bible every day. I wasn't getting up to pray. I wasn't rehearsing the scriptures. This happened right after I left a group for 13 years. All of a sudden, I just quit praying. I quit reading, right? And I'm like, Lord, I'm just under it. It's like, dude, I'm right here. I'm telling him what's wrong with me instead of saying, Lord, give me the power to overcome the wrong thing. I'm saying, Lord, this is what's wrong with me. And he's like, I know. And I'm here with the grace to empower you to do it. And he did it. The moment I quit blaming everybody else, I quit blaming the leader of that group, I quit blaming my wife and my circumstances, I quit blaming my kids, I quit blaming my time. And I said, Lord, now give me the mind of Christ so that I can overcome this stuff. Amen? Amen? If we go back to the beginning, 1 Peter 2, thank you. Let's go back to the beginning, 1 Peter 2, but verse 11 says this, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshy lusts, which wage war against your soul. The lusts of your body, the lusts of the flesh, are literally at odds with you constantly. It never stops, right? The question is, how much do you want to give into it? How much do you want to give into it? I don't want to give into it, man. I'm tight. Listen, what brought me to the cross was the stuff of the flesh. That's what got me saved, was like, Lord, I'm, I'm under the sin of it. And he made me realize it through the law. I realized, holy smokes, Romans 7 said it. The law came, sin revived, I died. When the law came to me, I was like, whoa, I'm doing what? Because everybody knows. Dude, even heathen people know, I'm a sinner. Oh, but you show them the holiness of God, it amplifies. Paul said it made my sin exceedingly sinful. So it amplified what I was seeing and believing. Sometimes, we just need to flee and abstain from the temptations that come. Is it hard? Yeah. Yes! Of course it's difficult. Of course, it, listen to me. Some of you in the room are thinking, this isn't for me. It's exactly for you. Dude, the war of the flesh and spirit is real. It's real. But then there's this analogy, Pastor Todd drew, the body, soul, and spirit. Guess what's warring against the spirit? The body, right, and the soul. This, this thing. And then Pete preached last Wednesday about all scripture, right, is given by inspiration of God's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, correction, instruction, righteousness, right? That we can rightly divide the word of two, tr uh, truth, tooth. And then he used the other one where it talks about that the word of God divides the soul and the spirit. That's the whole purpose of the word of God is to divide your soul and your spirit, the soul and the spirit. And the Bible says we're supposed to be of the mind of the spirit, not on the minds of the flesh. And what, again, this is coming up a lot for me, and I'll tell you why, because I travel a lot, and I see a lot of these people, God bless them, man, they catch a wind of the Spirit, right? And then they end up walking in this thing called the Spirit, and they get these experiences, and they know nothing of the Word. And then they fall, I get calls all the time, dude, I'm, I'm under it, yeah, because are you in the Word? The Word of God will teach you what to abstain from, right? Blaming a Spirit, for your sins or faults has given the enemy more power than he deserves. You know what happens after that? We end up taking no responsibility for what we do wrong. So then how can forget God forgive something we're not responsible for? That doesn't make any sense, right? Because how can we be responsible if we're not able to resist? 
Third, we're lured into thinking that we are powerless without the aid of a deliverance minister. <laughs> okay, listen. All these folks that we have pray for you up here, amazing. The best. I mean, they labor over you. They fast over you. Rain, I know you pray for people. It's pretty powerful, right? But did you know that that same spirit that dwells in them dwells in you? Come on! You know, you could be at home, and you don't have to say, I'm going to wait till Sunday to get prayed for. No, right now. I'm not giving the enemy any more foothold in my life. I'm not allowing sin to corrupt my life anymore. I'm not allowing him to take on over my thoughts anymore. He will not have a stronghold of fear over me. I'm not going to allow that to happen. You know why? Because not only am I at stake in my soul, my kids are also at stake. And the Bible says when we first read that we're supposed to be an example to those that don't believe. How can we be that if we're just like them? That's where it is. Now, here's the grace of it. Come on, somebody. Here's the grace of it. Here's the grace of it. The flesh is always going to try to take you down, and the reason we need to be renewed day by day, this is the reason we need to be renewed, the reason we need to pull down strongholds and cast down imaginations that come against God. This is why living in what-if land is so demonic. What if this happens? What if that happens? What if here? What if there? Listen, what if thoughts are put, you're putting faith in something that does not exist, Listen, you're putting your faith in something that doesn't exist, that has no foundation. So your faith is on something that has no foundation. Guess what breeds in that? Fear. When my eyes are supposed to be fixed on the author and the finisher of my faith, right? So when you live in what if land and all these other things, it breeds sin. Can God really do this? Can he take care of me? Dude, tell me he hasn't taken care of you up until this point. Tell me he hasn't performed it. You know all those testimonies you go through? It's because a greater one is coming. So he wants you to remember those things so you can walk in victory and in power. Amen? <clears throat> the good news is God doesn't want us, oh, God doesn't want you to go from deliverance to deliverance. God doesn't want you to go from broken stronghold to broken stronghold. He wants you to go from glory to glory. Glory to, listen. He wants you to go from glory to glory. And nowhere when I see him talk about the spirit where he talks about the flesh with it like that. You know when he talks about the spirit and sin and all these other things? He talks about, but I thank God through Jesus. They start to magnify the risen Christ. They start to magnify the cross. They start to say, I'm not of that mindset anymore. I'm of the mindset of Jesus now. I can walk in power and in victory. I can be clean. When Alicia was singing the song, there was, you, you were like singing, thank you for making me clean. What was that line you were saying? It's like there's something powerful to say, Lord, you have cleansed me from all unrighteousness. You've cleansed me from all wickedness. I don't have to walk walk in those things anymore. I don't desire the things of the flesh anymore. I don't want them. How can you tell someone to get delivered from unrighteousness and you're walking in it? How can you do that? You know why people aren't effective witnesses anymore? Because they're bound in sin. That's why you can't witness. It's as simple as, as that. It really is. Because we don't see God, we're bound in sin, and it's hard for us to witness to somebody else because we haven't experienced the deliverer. But man, when you do, oh my gosh, when you see him operate, when you see him take away fear and doubt, and where, when you see him heal, when you see him, how he took away your sin, he doesn't even remember it. When you see the attack from the enemy and you recognize it, you're like, oh, I get it. Now I got to tell people about this goodness and warn them that that enemy's trying to kill him. And he doesn't have the strong, he doesn't have a foothold in their life. Amen. Richard Sibbs, a theologian from the late 1500s, said this once. Satan gave Adam an apple and took away paradise. Therefore, in all temptations, let us not consider what Satan offers, but what we shall lose. You fall into temptation and sin. It's not so much what Satan offered you to fall into temptation. It's the blessing that you lost. Is it worth it? No. Nah. How many of us know it took you a while to hear the voice of God to get rid of your sin, to get, quit being apathetic? Amen? Like it took you a minute. Some of y'all were a little bit more hard-headed than others. Cool. I'm that guy. I need to get rocked over the head with a hammer. Trust me, I've been there. But dude, I keep thinking sometimes about, yeah, God redeems the time. He is so faithful to me. But man, had I learned this a little earlier? Oh my gosh, can you imagine if I had this fire in high school? Come on, somebody. Dude. 
That would have been awesome. And in college, I probably wouldn't have flunked. But I remember when I got saved in college, first thing I wanted to do was witness to people because God radically transformed me. He did. He changed my life. I was like, well, I got to tell people about this, right? You don't want to lose what the victory on the other side is due to a stronghold or an excuse like the devil made me do it. You don't want to lose your victory because the devil made you do it. The devil didn't make you do nothing, okay? He doesn't. He can't make you. He doesn't have power or authority over you. You're a redeemed, blood-bought child of God. You are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. You are his purchased possession. You no longer live for yourself. You live under Christ. He doesn't have, listen, he doesn't have authority over you. He cannot make you sin, uh, nor can your flesh. He can't make you sin. You don't, listen, Romans 8, you don't have to sin. When you're redeemed and your spirit is different, it's changed, it's renewed, I don't want to anymore. I don't want to do it. Amen? This is where it gets cool. You don't want to lose your victory because of an excuse. Romans 12, 2, don't conform to the pattern. We all know the scripture, but listen, don't conform to the pattern. Is he saying, don't let the enemy conform you to the pattern of the world, or don't conform to the pattern of the world? I'm talking to you. Don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. When you're in his will, all you want to do is magnify him, his excellencies, not the problems, the solutions. It's Christ Jesus, my Lord, Paul said. It's Christ Jesus. Joshua 1.8, the book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it night and day so that you may be careful to do all that is written for then you will make your way prosperous and you will have good success. When you meditate on the things of God, you can't but win. You can't but have victory. And he's not doing it for you to have victory. He's doing it so he can get glorified. All things are from him, through him, and to him. You ain't got nothing to do with it. You meditate on his word, amen? Here's another one, 1 Peter 2, 9, but you are a chosen race. I'm going back to the beginning. You're a chosen race. You were chosen. You weren't chosen to die. You weren't chosen to be laden in sin the rest of your life. You weren't chosen to, to be defeated. Louis, seriously, you weren't chosen to be defeated. You were chosen to have victory. All of you, you were chosen to have victory in your life. You were chosen to walk in the will of God. You were chosen to destroy the works of darkness. You were chosen for a purpose. You were chosen. You're a royal priesthood. All of you are priests. And priestesses. All of you are priests and priestesses. You have the authority of the word behind you. It's your word too, right? You're a holy nation. You're a holy nation. That everywhere we go, no matter what we're doing, we carry the holiness of the living God within us to be translated to the world, a people for God's own possession. We are different than the world. We're not like the world. We don't live like the world. We don't act like the world so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Yeah. Whew, when you're his, all you want to do is talk about how good he is, how excellent he is, and what he wants to do. And when you face the struggle, you know what you're doing? Lord, I don't struggle with, no, 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 no. That is the flesh. What does the spirit say? That is the flesh. What does the word say? Now, if you're under demonic oppression, come up here and get delivered tonight. You want to know what it is? Something that's like, Lord, I can't shake this right now. Cool. Come on up. I see my wife break, break off the spirit of fear this week. Praise God. The spirit of fear was heavy. And it's like, Lord, Lord, this doesn't belong to her. She didn't ask for this. And it doesn't belong in her mind either, Father. Give her the mind of Christ. And she broke through. You can too. Can the altar ministers come forward and everybody stand, please? Guys, tonight, this is about, you know, this could be a simple sermon, but I love rehearsing this stuff to myself because all it shows me is the goodness of God. All it shows me is what he saved me for and what he saved me to. All it shows me is he gets all the credit and all I'm doing is just preaching his word and living it as best I can. He's given us the spirit to overcome temptations, faults, fears, worries, all of it. He's given you the authority to overcome every single thing in your life. Dude, I'm telling you, it's pretty powerful when you walk in it. It's pretty powerful. So Lord, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, Father, we thank you. Thank you, Lord, for the overcoming power of the spirit. Thank you, Lord, that you're, you're the overcomer that does all things 
according to your will. Thank you, Lord, that people tonight realize they don't have to walk in sickness. They don't have to walk in disease. They don't have to walk in sin. They don't have to walk in a mindset of failure and defeat, but they can walk in the mindset of God. In Jesus' name, walk with the power of the living God and be healed by the power of the name of the Lord. In Jesus' name, we thank you for the blood, Christ, and we thank you for dying for us, and not only that, but resurrecting to give us a new life. In Jesus' name, Lord. Tonight, it's about power. It's about the authority to command and say, no, I'm not giving in anymore. I'm not. It's one of those things where sometimes this happens in church. We draw a line in the sand. We're not doing this no more. We don't want to hear about it. Dude, (laughs) I want the Lord to break everything off this body. Everything. Gossip, deceit, lies, the lies in your belief system. So that we can walk free. So we can be prophetic and walk in power. You know what's funny? I love church. I love when you guys come because it's awesome when everybody sings and is rejoicing. We should be having church out there too. And we can do it if we submit to it. I want you to come up for prayer tonight. Please. I, I don't care what you say, but tonight's the night. I just believe him. I was just at a church in Missouri on Sunday and the Holy Spirit broke. And now he's calling Pastor Todd and saying, how do we do this? It's happening, y'all. It is happening. It is happening. We don't have to wonder anymore. We don't have to wonder anymore. It can happen for you. He wants to restore the marriages. He wants to restore your relationships. He wants to do all these things because he loves you. So come on up for prayer tonight. Come on up. Get broken from the things that you don't need anymore. See God work in a way you've never seen before. Now's the time. Again, Lord, go with us tonight in the name of Jesus as we go home. Lord, we carry this word in our hearts that we don't sin, that we walk in holiness in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you for joining us today at Revive Us Now at our YouTube channel. Remember to click that subscribe button to Revive Church and share this video with a friend. And if you'd like to support this ministry, go to reviveusnow.com forward slash give.